Mesdames, Messieurs, bonjour. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Euh, je voudrais euh, m'associer à tous les compliments et remerciements à l'équipe qui a permis cette conférence et à Thierry de, de Montréal. Alors, nous sommes avec vous et nous allons parler en canadien, c'est-à-dire nous allons passer au milieu des phrases de l'anglais euh, au français. Euh, nous sommes avec vous et en dialogue avec vous pendant euh, un peu plus d'une heure et demie pour parler de, du lien entre la conjoncture, les, les, les observations conjoncturelles sur l'ensemble de l'économie mondiale et puis les changements structurels dont ils sont porteurs. Et je voudrais introduire les panélistes en saluant notre toute dernière arrivée. I would like to introduce to you Mrs. Aminata Touré. Bonjour. Thank you to have joined us. Mrs. Aminata Touré has a long experience in uh, development economics, has worked for the United Nations system for a long time and has also shifted to politics and has been uh, the Prime Minister of Senegal and had various positions uh, in the Senegalese administration. But uh, Aminata, uh, I would say, is even broader than uh, Senegal and is clearly a very prominent uh, figure, character, uh, in terms of uh, African politics, and I would say broader than politics, uh, the extreme attention to public opinion. So, uh, and all the trends uh, in a fast, quickly changing Africa. So thank you very much, Mineta, to be with us. Uh, Monsieur Nicolas Véron, a great macroeconomist who has been a uh, a uh, founder of a major think tank of the European Union, the Bruegel think tank, and is also very connected with the macroeconomic community uh, in the USA. So he is a very global macroeconomist. So uh, despite a bit of resistance, I think he will open by the introductory remarks uh, what we have to think of uh, current outlook and how it shapes uh, the, the, the future. Pierre Jacquet, a long-term friend, is a major economist in development economist, in economics. He has been the chief economist of the Agence Française de Développement. Uh, he has also created uh, and managed a network of economists across the world, and I think he will be uh, very willing to make the link in between what we have just uh, experienced in terms of uh, outlook uh, and economic policy in extreme uh, situations and long-term trends. And Serge Equé, also a long-term uh, friend, is the CEO, chairman and CEO of the West African Development Bank, which is considered as uh, one of the best development banks in Africa in terms of track record, a growing one, very, very much growing, uh, in, in the middle of an experience of doubling the balance sheet uh, in a few months, uh, so very dynamic, but Serge, is also uh, a banker, a real banker, and a market banker, and uh, a bit more than a, a year ago, or a year ago, he yeah. was in Natixis, one of the major uh, European French corporate uh, bank banking institution, the head uh, of markets uh, for Europe. Uh, Middle East uh, and, and Africa. After a long career in Asia, as well as in London, as well as in Paris, 
on markets. And, and I think it will be very interesting to uh, uh, share the experience of somebody who has been a real banker on the markets, and the markets are evolving a lot in the current situation, and who has shifted uh, to becoming in charge of public goods in a development bank for West Africa and French-speaking West Africa, eight countries of West Africa. We will be joined uh, over uh, the, uh, <coughs> the screen by Mr. Xiao Yaidi. Uh, sorry for the pronunciation of, uh, of your name, um, uh, who is uh, in, in relation with us today. He is uh, a researcher, academic, uh, of China, and many questions, obviously, have started already in the first session to evoke a lot uh, <laughs> China and the Chinese position in the world of tomorrow and today. Uh, so thank you very much for being with us. And you have this uh, peculiarity you. of having been uh, not only trained in China, but also in the USA and uh, in one of the temples of the U.S. governance, the Kennedy School of Government of the Harvard University. <laughs> so you, you have a bit of a, uh, the experience of two worlds, and we are very grateful for, for you being with us today. Thank you. And uh, we... <laughs> thank you. And when, when uh, on your course, I mean, we, we will welcome uh, the Minister of Economy of the UAE, uh, who will uh, join us and uh, uh, share uh, his views. Uh, maybe two or three uh, introductory uh, remarks. Um, I'm not a very great specialist of outlook, economic, macroeconomic outlook, even if when I was a young economist, I, uh, I, I was in, in a department <laughs> Uh, following uh, the outlook, but I have a few questions for, for my, my fellow uh, panelists uh, and a few remarks. And maybe I will shift to French for, for, for the beginning. Premier point, je crois que les crises sans précédent se succèdent. Euh, la crise actuelle est sans précédent, elle a des caractères exceptionnels, mais enfin la précédente de 2008 était sans précédent également dans sa brutalité, dans, euh, dans l'importance de la récession qu'elle a créée, même si maintenant nous avons battu les records euh, en termes euh, de, de, de récession. Les crises précédentes, qu'il s'agisse de l'éclatement de la bulle des technologies, euh, qu'il s'agisse de crises proprement financières ou de crises proprement immobilières, ont chacune des traits tout à fait originaux. Mais il y a une chose qui est commune à toutes ces crises importantes, c'est qu'elles ont des conséquences politiques, sociales, géopolitiques profondes. Et donc, je pense, et je dis ça pour Mme Touré euh, et son expérience euh, de la, des situations politiques, d'après-crise, pour également euh, Pierre Jacquet, euh, qu'est-ce que la situation économique d'aujourd'hui nous annonce rapidement en termes de conséquences sociales, en termes de conséquences politiques euh, Parfois, on fait des liens entre le développement du populisme après-crise, mais au fond, c'est souvent... Des, euh, une certaine brutalité des conséquences. Et j'aimerais bien qu'à un moment donné, peut-être en conclusion, on puisse aborder ce, ce point dont je sais qu'il est cher à, à Pierre Jacquet et, et, et à Aminata Touré. Ma deuxième, euh, ma deuxième requête, et c'est peut-être plutôt pour les économistes, pour Nicolas Véron, pour Serge Écoué, mais... Euh, on a rarement connu une reprise après crise aussi puissante que celle qu'on observe. Euh, on a rarement eu 
des trimestres avec des contrastes pareils. Euh, prenez un pays comme la France, vous avez 13% de récession pendant le deuxième trimestre et 18,5% de croissance pendant le troisième trimestre. Et globalement, on est en train, dans un grand nombre de pays, de réviser à la hausse euh, toutes les prévisions maintenant sur l'année 2021 que nous sommes en, en train de vivre. Pratiquement, en France, on va avoir euh, un niveau record de croissance, inconnu sauf dans une ou deux années d'après-guerre. Euh, et et, et, et cette, cette, cette brutalité de la reprise, qui n'était pas anticipée par les conjoncturistes, elle n'est pas que française, elle n'est pas que européenne, elle est encore beaucoup plus forte aux États-Unis. Et je demanderai à Serge Écoué ce qu'il voit, mais elle est forte également en Afrique. L'Afrique, à la surprise générale, a eu une récession plus faible que ce qui était attendu, très limitée à un certain nombre de pays pour des raisons sectorielles qui sont dépendants des cours de matières premières minérales ou du tourisme et qui ont été très affectés. Mais enfin, 30 pays sur 55 en Afrique ne sont pas entrés en récession, ce qui est le cas dans la zone de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, dont Serge est un acteur et un témoin, ainsi que Aminata, et où se trouve mon pays, d'ailleurs, le Bénin. Donc, c'est vraiment une reprise tout à fait exceptionnelle, tout à fait étrange, qui crée des pénuries, qui crée des raretés. Pour les macroéconomistes, est-ce que c'est un vrai risque d'inflation durable je pense que c'est intéressant d'écouter Nicolas. Ou est-ce que ce sont, et Pierre, ou est-ce que ce sont des phénomènes de disruption, des phénomènes de euh, rareté, des applications des lois euh, de Gregory King sur euh, euh, une pénurie entraîne des, des, des effets de prix très importants Ou bien est-ce que l'on va vers des changements assez profonds en matière de, de prix, de système, de niveau général des prix, de, avec des distorsions importantes. Et une autre question que, que, que j'ai pour les, les macroéconomistes, c'est en matière de travail. Euh, il y a eu quand même quelque chose qu'on a découvert pendant la pandémie, mais qu'on découvre également pendant les guerres, le caractère indispensable des gens ordinaires et qu'on retrouve aujourd'hui dans une reprise de pure surchauffe dans laquelle vous avez des pénuries de main dœuvre des, des, pro des problèmes sérieux de recrutement et la crise des chauffeurs de camions qui n'est pas que britannique. Parce que partout dans le monde, les prix de la logistique explose parce qu'on a des raretés euh, sérieuses. Mais le lorry driver, le British lorry driver, est un symbole of a major change. We are totally vulnerable and dependent, dependent upon the ordinary people. Est-ce que là, dans le domaine du travail, dans le domaine des prix du travail, il n'y a pas une recomposition très forte qui s'annonce et, et ça, est-ce que ce n'est pas un changement qu'on va observer mondialement Et là, là-dessus, j'aimerais bien que, que Nicolas ou, ou, ou Pierre puissent partager avec nous leur vision. Voilà quelques questions, disons, euh, qui, qui moi me, me, me préoccupent euh, et je donnerai bien la parole pour commencer, nous dresser un peu le tableau euh, à Nicolas Véron. Merci, Président. Pour euh, obéir à vos instructions de parler canadien, je vais parler surtout en anglais. Uh, looking back at the period since uh, early 2020, I, I would like to start with the observation of a number of good news. Um, and I think it is remarkable. Of course, the, the pandemic has been a, an incredible tragedy. We 
we've had millions of uh, casualties from the virus. This dominates everything. And um, I live in Washington, D.C. In, in Washington, D.C., there is a, an art installation right now on the National Mall, just uh, below the, uh, the Washington Monument, with little flags, one little white flag for each American person who has died from uh, COVID-19 uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And it's, it's, it's a very powerful installation. So, so I think this should dominate, of course, uh, any perception of what has happened in the last year and a half. But there have been a number of good news, and let me uh, go through uh, a few of them. One of them, which sounds so obvious that we're not debating it in, anymore, but which I think was not to be taken for granted, is that essentially all countries in their public policy reaction to the pandemic have put lives first. Now we know that lockdown strategies are the first response to the virus, especially at the beginning when there was no vaccine. This was not to be taken for granted. China, the country where the virus first appeared, invented an incredibly disruptive strategy when it locked down Wuhan. Now we forget how disruptive that was. When I remember when I learned the news of the lockdown of Wuhan, I couldn't believe it. I, I didn't think it was possible lock down an entire mega city for health reasons. The Chinese government, a full government, a government that is often accused to put economy before people, put the people before the economy, took a very early decision, very clear one, that they wouldn't uh, let economic imperatives go in the way of protecting lives. I think this is Il a pas de traduction. Inspiring, uh, despite all the other issues with human rights that exist in China. And it has been emulated throughout the world. Uh, there has been an incredible effort of scientific cooperation. We see, I think, rightly our world as one which is dominated by risks of fragmentation, of decoupling, of escalation between great powers. But if you look at the strategies to mitigate the pandemic, and to find responses, thanks to science, they've been incredibly collaborative. The vaccines are the indication of that as well. Vaccines have come incredibly quickly, really without precedent in the history of um, vaccination and healthcare. Uh, of course, there is a lot of inequality in implementation and this should be felt by each of us as a challenge. We're probably all of us here amongst the first one or two percent of vaccinated people in, on the planet. We should be aware of that privilege. But the deployment of the vaccine, the discovery of the vaccine and its deployment, their deployment, uh, has been, uh, I think, uh, amazingly successful and uh, has been the, the, the real response to the crisis. In political terms, uh, Lionel, you alluded to this. What will this uh, pandemic result in in terms of political trends? Well, Joe Biden was elected president of the United States against Donald Trump. I think if we look, look at the fundamentals and a number of studies, it is very probable, even so we will never know for sure, that if we hadn't had the pandemic, Donald Trump would have been re-elected. And therefore, the notion that hardship creates a ground for populism is not vindicated in the experience we had. And actually, when you look at the European Union, you, you see similar trends. The last election on, in Germany was a, a triumph for moderate centrism. The four main parties that came first this time, center-right, center-left, cent, uh, liberals and green, increase their total share of the vote. The radical parties on the far left and the far right decrease their share of the vote. Uh, and I, for one, expect something similar to happen next year in my country of France, even so, of course, it's too early to be sure of anything. More importantly, perhaps, the European Union has reacted very vigorously to the threat of the pandemic, which did create risks of fragmentation early on with this completely unprecedented program of next generation EU, which is not only a lot of money, but for the first time, transfers of that magnitude agreed between member states. 
and perhaps even more importantly for those of us in finance, for the first time, massive amounts of borrowing directly by the European Union in its own name, which has the potential of creating a new benchmark for markets, a new safe assets, if you will. There have been some auctions where the EU debt has actually priced at the level which is more secure, lower yield than even German sovereign debt of the same maturity. And I think this uh, apparent benign political effect of uh, the pandemic is uh, not only a rich country phenomenon. If you look at the trends, for example, the, the prospects for the Brazilian election, it appears, well, you could say this is, you know, uh, a left-wing populism versus right-wing populism, but I think many of us can agree that uh, Bolsonaro's populism is more disruptive and more threatening than Lula's. And uh, what we see as a prospect for that election, to take only one example among uh, emerging, large emerging countries, uh, is also reassuring uh, for that matter. Now, I don't want to sound like everything is fine in the world. It's not, and I started with the number of uh, death and miseries that the pandemic has brought. Let me uh, mention a few uncertainties on the outlook. The first one comes from the virus itself, because the virus is still with us massively, and it keeps mutating, and uh, we're not secure that we won't get a variant that completely changes the equation. So the virus, as it has been the case continuously for the past 20, um, 18 months or more, is the number one driver of the outlook. It's a very short-term driver because it can give us very short-term news and therefore nothing can be taken for granted at this point. It's a moment, as it has been continuously for 18 months, of very high uncertainty. The response to the virus is a vaccine. That's the second uncertainty factor. We've seen reasonably good take-up of the vaccine in a number of countries, but we've also seen it plateauing in some countries, particularly in the US which started early, but has now uh, very low rates of vaccination compared to uh, the potential. And at this point, it's clear it's not due to uh, supply problems. It's due to the low acceptance by population. And it's not only the US. There are many countries, including poor countries, where people are very reluctant to accept the vaccine because they don't trust the authorities. And this is a major risk on the economic outlook because we need people to get vaccinated if we want to get back to a normal economic functioning. Third uncertainty, you mentioned it, Lionel. Um, we don't understand supply chains. They react to the current stress in a way that nobody could have exactly uh, foreseen. And we will have more problems with scarcity, with difficulties of adjustment, with the... Uh, uh, read across in terms of inflation, which frankly I don't think any economist can predict with certainty at this point. I, for one, uh, follow and approve the stance of the main central banks, both the Fed and the ECB. They have a difficult job. I think their current approach makes sense to me, but there can be no confidence that it will be proved to be the right one ex post when we know what will have happened in the meantime. So here again, massive uncertainty. And finally, uh, we mentioned all the pleasant surprises in terms of the rebound and the economic um, outlook it, it looks like now. But there is very high debt everywhere in the world. The debt has increased a lot uh, in rich and poor countries alike. And so we're not well protected against the prospect of a government debt crisis, particularly in poor countries, uh, which has to be a concern going forward uh, continuously. It's been good surprises so far, but I think there could be a number of game changers, uh, not everywhere, but in a number of countries, uh, if uh, conditions become a bit less benign. I'll stop there and look forward to our conversation. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolas. Uh, I think it was very interesting for, 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 for us to hear you uh, mentioning the, the cooperative, the collaborative uh, response that we have seen in certain cases during this uh, pandemic, and also the, the, the speed of uh, the vaccination uh, availability. Uh, even if the African people on this stage 
we have a bit of a different view because it has been a very collaborative situation in, in between uh, the major powers and the richest countries and uh, really a shame in terms of international cooperation and remains so in a sense vis-à-vis uh, -vis certain uh, com countries. The, the nationalism in vaccination uh, has been such that uh, even if the African Union has been very well organized in terms of logistics and financing, it has been, in a sense, put out of the market for access to vaccination, to vaccine, which, which is a bit of an issue. Uh, despite that, uh, in terms of the impact the sanitary impact in Africa, uh, it is less than one-tenth of what has been observed uh, in Europe. But today, uh, it could well become far more uh, uh, dangerous with this very low level of 3% of the African population vaccinated. Um, but there were some elements of, of, of collaboration. You also mentioned that the EU has changed some of its policies and has been, in a sense, efficient. Uh, I would also say that we have seen that on other continents. And again, the African Union, uh, in terms of uh, debt management, for instance, uh, and in the development of the SDR, the droits de tirage spéciaux distribution, uh, has been well organized and very well organized together with the United, with, with, with uh, the European Union. So th there were some progress in terms of collective governance, I think, which uh, you, you, you have mentioned and, uh, and are important. And you, you, you have mentioned central banks to say that in a sense they've been efficient and you mentioned them about the fact that there is no panic against the inflation today uh, and more uncertainties, but in a sense it's monitor, monitored carefully by the, the central bank. I think the central banks have been very important uh, uh, players during uh, these pandemics across the world, uh, even if it's more uh, clearer in OECD or China than uh, in uh, emerging and developing uh, countries. So thank you very much. In, indeed, and I think we will come back to this question of uh, inflation. But I would be tempted to uh, ask our Chinese guest uh, what, is view, what is his view on where we are uh, in terms of the recovery. Uh, China has not had a recession experience, uh, so it's a, bit, it's a bit different of the major uh, powers. Uh, what is uh, also the situation in terms of what could be the macroeconomic consequences of the uh, geopolitical situation with the USA? Uh, so, wh wh what is the recovery in your in in your mind, and how could you be in a situation where China finances the US? The trade has never been that high. The US deficit has never been that high. The interdependence has never been that high. Yet, uh, we have a major uncertainty on this relationship. OK. Yeah, yeah thank you uh, for your uh, introduction. Um, relative to other economies, uh, China economy has been doing better uh, since the uh, outbreak of the pandemic. Uh, last year, the GDP growth uh, in China is 2.3%. Um, as Mr. Vernon mentioned, um, China Chinese government uh, took very strict approach, uh, even locked down whole city. Uh, so the fundamental reason behind the economic growth 
uh, is Chinese government uh, is taking approach we call zero cleaning uh, approach. Uh, so in China, uh, we are pretty much live a normal life, uh, except when we enter the public affair, we have to wear masks or show our green coat on our uh, mobile phone. Uh, the success of the approach in China are uh, due to several reasons. Uh, I guess probably due to uh, China have a special social structure and a cultural habit. Uh, for example, most people are willing to give up uh, partial personal freedom and uh, partial uh, privacy or collective interest. Also, high tech uh, play very important role uh, in this area because most Chinese are using smartphone everywhere. So it's unlikely for other country to copy or use the approach uh, in China. Also, the approach itself is not costless. The, actually, the consumption in China lagged behind. Well, export became a major uh, driving force. I think it cannot be successful, uh, sustainable, uh, uh, because when you look at the date uh, in past two months, in July and August, they have already shown the growth a little bit slowing down. Uh, for example, in fixed capital investment, uh, in August, only 8%, 8.9%. You have to remember in May, the fixed capital investment grows 15.4%. Uh, also consumption in August, only grows 2.5%. Uh, so China also facing uh, uh, some uncertainty and, uh, and the challenges. First of all, they have to transfer from uh, zero clean approach to a more tolerated Second, they have to make a balance uh, between reasonable uh, economic growth and uh, prevent financial risks. Uh, probably you heard some news happening in China. One of largest developed uh, uh, Honda got a trouble in their date, date issue. So that's something Chinese government have to deal with. Uh, another big issue or big uncertainty is the relationship with, with the United States. Um, in, uh, since um, Trump administration uh, took regime, uh, the relationship between US and uh, China get worse. Uh, until re, um, Biden administration, because Biden administration still tried to uh, effort to unite airlines to contain China. But good thing is we can see after second telephone call between Biden and uh, Xi Jinping, uh, it seems the tension is a little bit of easing up, uh, at least in rhetoric and the service. Uh, a recent example, uh, the release of Meng Wanzhou, C CFO of Huawei Technology. Uh, of course, 
the competition between U.S. and China will last for many, many years in the future. Uh, the, the, the problem for U.S. and the Chinese government, they have to control managing the, the competition in order to avoid the confrontation, uh, which is very dangerous, uh, not only to U.S. and China, but also to the whole world. I guess in the in the future, uh, the outlook of the political and the economic uh, outlook in the world pretty much depend on the tension on the relationship between U.S. and China. Uh, whether these two countries can uh, well handle their their relationship. I just stop here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Yidi. Uh, uh, it was uh, an impressive uh, view of uh, the Chinese uh, situation, and you mentioned how cultural has been the response. It's not purely a question of economics. It's, it has been uh, a very... Uh, efficient cultural and political response in a sense uh, uh, and it explains a lot of the uh, recovery the very fast recovery you also mentioned how much the exports are driving uh, the, 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 the economy uh, uh, and on this US China and I think you will have questions in the audience <laughs> uh, Competition is there for many, many, many years. Uh, already in the previous session, Mr. Thomas G Gomar underlined the fact that China has become the first partner for trade and sometimes also for investment, namely in uh, infrastructures, but has become by far the number one trade partner if you take a continent I know a bit better than others, Africa, China is the first partner of 48 countries out of 55. It's quite an achievement. Yeah. Quite an achievement. And if you consider the European Union as a whole and as one country, yes, here is the real competition, because the, the other major partner is the European Union. And then it's a totally different picture, if you do not consider uh, Germany, France and so on, isolated by the European Union and the real competition. And I was a bit surprised because it has not been evoked in the previous uh, session. The European Union is the first uh, player of the international trade challenged by China. The US is nowhere. Just because this simple addition of exports of Germany plus France, or Germany plus Italy, or Germany plus Benelux, is more than the total of the US exports. Only yeah. two countries among the big countries, big economies of the European Union, are enough to match the exports of the United States of America. So, yes, it's very interesting, this competition between China and US, and it is there for a long time, and it's very important sec in major sectors. Yet, the main partners, and probably for decades, in, in, in the trade, as we see that in emerging countries, is European Union versus China. And here it's more collaborative and less, uh, less of a problem. But thank you very much, and I think you will have many, many questions. May, may I uh, now shift to you, Aminata, and you, Serge, uh, to, to, to give us uh, a view of where we are in terms of uh, 
outlook? Are we in a real recovery? Are we in major uncertainties uh, from what, what you see? And what could be the geopolitical or the political and social consequences of something which in a continent, in this continent, has been maybe a bit more a humanitarian issue and a real social issue, even more than a sanitary issue in a sense. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I think that first of all, WHO and the United Nations owe Africa an apology and we are still waiting for it. It was announced that we would die by million. We didn't. We are very much here and standing. So that, apo that apologies are to be sent to us. Um, many theories, you know, uh, came up. That's because we were eating a lot of, we were taking a lot of uh, uh, chloroquine uh, to fight malaria. That's why we were more resistant, etc. But I think it was just the result of the underestimation of the capacity and the abilities of African countries to, to, to deal with crisis. And yet, if, we, uh, if the analysis was made a little bit uh, deeper, um, WHO would understand that we have the biggest experience in terms of find, uh, fighting pandemics. I was prime minister when Ebola uh, struck in uh, uh, studying in, 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 in Sierra Leone, in, in Guinea, etc. Um, that's my experience that we fought it. Um, so we built upon that experience uh, to take the right decision in many countries. Um, that was not a complete lockdown. That was sometime halfway because it's, it wasn't possible to do what happened in Wuhan, impossible in, uh, in, in Africa. Uh, but the right measures, I think, helped uh, to contain and limit the damages. So that also needs to be clearly acknowledged. It's not by random that uh, we are the less affected. No, it's the result of sound decisions that were taken with huge, huge negative consequences. Um, let me take an example, Senegal, that's the easiest. Um, when the pandemic started, we were up to 7% of economic growth. 12 months later, we went under 1%. So that, that's huge, and it takes huge time to recover that. Um, let's also know that, uh, we do know that, but we, it's good to, to, to recall that, 70 to 85% of our economies are informal, which means that they are not recorded in the books. So these are uh, the noble people, as you call them, Prime Minister Zensu, um, who go day by day after their life trying to make a living day by day. So when you take restriction measures in terms of movement, limitation of uh, work time, I mean, you're affecting a huge cohort of populations. And it takes time to recover that, and we are still in a recovery phase, from what I see. Uh, so it's um, something that we also have to acknowledge that, and I've seen, I think that was two days ago, a study so it's a, saying that we might lose some life expectancy progress that we have done we realize over the, you know, the last decades just because of COVID. So we have to have a, 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 a broader understanding, uh, as you said, linking the social impact and the economic prospect. I think it's very, very important in the recovery phase, which means that we will have to put the money where the mouses are, which means that we will need also to support um, a sector that is vital the informal sector, of course, there is a whole discussion about how to move from informal to formal, but you know, we, we will carry on that discussion, but for the time being, we have to pick them up so people can come back to their regular uh, standards. Um, you, and if you, have, if you have witnessed in many countries, including mine, um, few months after uh, uh, COVID, I mean, we witnessed some unrest in many places. But the real reason was that it was unbearable anymore. People have lost their the, 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 the means of living um, and became uh, utterly poor. So 
if we want to uh, sort of look into the future, but at the same time, uh, that was a great experience to, to, to build upon from a governance perspective. Of course, as I said, for the poorest and the most vulnerable, that was a, you know, a dramatic experience and they're still recovering. But for the government, in terms of budgeting, uh, what it also, um, what lesson we have learned is that we can also count on our own strengths because that's what we have um, demonstrated. A great resilience um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the front of what we have seen. Um, somehow, uh, COVID was sort of a wake-up call for dreamers like all of us. That's why I'm you know, so uh, happy that this gathering ha is happening. Because the first uh, collateral damage of COVID was multilateralism. International cooperation was dead, as we know. It was impossible to move from a country to another. Uh, airplanes, everything, you know, went uh, closed. And of course, um, we all have witnessed the, the, the fight over, you know, this one the mask, let alone the vaccine. And that is also a question that is very important. So that's where it's important to link the health and the economy. Because and that's a slogan, but it's so real. Nobody's safe until we all are safe. I mean, we know that there is 194 UN membership, but if we don't take the right course of action, we would end up with 194 variant of the COVID. So we are in this crisis for a long time if we don't take the proper measures. But what we are seeing, nationalism around vaccine, countries would have even the means to, to, to buy and not having you know, anybody to, you know, uh, from who you can, you, can, you, can, you can buy the vaccine because people are now in third um, dose of vaccine while others, as uh, it was said, we are very privileged. Um, but how long we can sustain that and at the same time uh, expects to have a full recovery of uh, the international economy. So that is something that we really need to sort of reflect upon and um, link much more the economic community and the social community, maybe under the umbrella of forums like this one, the UN's and, and others. Um, so that is... Uh, something that we, we, we really need to reflect upon. But we also learn, um, you know, from a governance point of view, that there are immediate and urgent action to be taken. It's how Africa is going to build its medical and pharmaceutical independence. For me, it seems like the, the critical question that uh, the African Union needs to, uh, to, to solve and to make progress upon. Um, that's what we have learned. Until you get, you know, uh, independent, when we because we, we 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 saw it, you know. I mean, that was really, really sobering, as a matter of fact. You know, we've been, you know, conceptualizing about globalization, the global village, etc. But we saw that we were very far from that. We immediately uh, felt into, you know, a very hardcore nationalism that we haven't seen, I think, for a long time. Um, so. From an Africa point of view, I think we have to move forward in terms of having collective projects. Um, we are only commercing between ourselves up to 12%. In the rest of the world, it's 60% in Europe. I think it's a little bit less than 60% in Asia. We are just 12%, which means that we have a, a space to, 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 to grow. But we have to uh, sort of uh, go beyond the boundaries and, and see how we're going to put together, I mean, this major, major, major project. And the first one being, as I said, uh, the medical and pharmaceutical um, uh, independence, because the last thing we would like to see happening is COVID becoming sort of a public um, health permanent issues, you know, staying between one, two, three percent for the rest of the time. Uh, and if we don't take the, course of the right course of action, that's what is going to happen. And we know who are the ones who are going to suffer the most, as we know it, 
uh, you know, it's the same for all pandemics. It's going to be those who are the most vulnerable in rural areas, uh, you know, women and, and young people most of the time. So making the link between what happened and even the stability of the continent and the needs to have internal response to the challenges seems to be very important to me. That opened up the question about industrialization. That was the same thing. Because as we commerce, only 12% between ourselves, um, we, we import most of you know, the goods that we consume. Um, we, not, we, we realize that, well, we have to produce simple goods and that's also an opportunity for you know, the, the, the rest of the world to invest in Africa. We think that industrialization more than ever in the eyes of you know, what we are, the pandemics and the, the lesson learned from the pandemics, I think uh, we cannot postpone any longer our industrialization pro you know, uh, prospect. Um, and I think the good way to start might be in the pharmaceutical uh, sector, but also in all sectors. Um, because we face also um, uh, the whole issue around procurement of simple things, uh, syringe sometimes. I mean, simple things. Uh, and that's the lesson that really we want to learn. Um, and it opened up also the, 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 the possibility of creating jobs in a continent where 70% of the population is below the age of 35. So it's a mix. Um, of course, we resisted. We've been resilient because we were the less affected. And it's not by random. It's because we demonstrated capacities uh, in terms of taking the good actions. But at the same time, we suffered a lot because we didn't, of course, we didn't see uh, what we thought happened and was the reality. Multilateralism and international cooperation just was wiped off the, off the table. So we had to cut it to ourselves, which is a good thing. I think it reinforced our self-confidence and we have to carry it forward in terms of, as I said, our sovereignty when it comes to medical and pharmaceutical, but at the same time globally in terms of industrialization. So I think it's challenging, but at the same time, it's open up avenues that we have to courageously uh, take up. Thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> Madam Prime Minister. Uh, you, you addressed the complexity of the situation and the dualism of the situation. Uh, I liked very much <clears throat> when you say that uh, Africa has been resilient, has uh, beca <clears throat> become aware of its own strength, uh, has, be has been well uh, and quickly organized uh, in a sense, and globally was underestimated. Uh, so <clears throat> there was a performance of Africa, and the resilience is not a hazard. Yet, you are emph emphasizing uh, the informal sector situation, which is a major difference. that We share maybe with some countries in uh, the Indian subcontinent, <coughs> sorry, but which is very different from the rest of the world where 50% of our GDP in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, is made by the informal sector. Uh, in your country, it's probably 80% of employment. It's 90% in mine. But even in a bit more uh, advanced countries in terms of evolution, like Maghreb, uh, it remains 30 to 40% of the employment. And the number one uh, creator of new jobs. Yet, uh, we had no means for the government to support efficiently this informal sector and the SMEs in general in our countries uh, of, of very small uh, uh, firms. Uh, we had not the same uh, public finance resources uh, to support the households and the SMEs and the corporate world in general. Nothing like in the OECD countries. So it's 
very important that you emphasize that uh, it, it, it has made aware everybody in Africa and I think in part of Asia of the fact that we have to define new governance rules and develop the independence. And you say it in the health system, in the manufacturing system, uh, it will accelerate the trend to a major change of our economy. Uh, because, yes, we can, in certain extreme situations, be efficient. But we have structural uh, weaknesses. What is important is that we know that we, we can address them and tackle them. And that is a major change. It's not purely a question of recession and recovery. It's a major change for the, for the future, uh, I think. Serge, could I ask you, as a man of markets, financial markets, and now uh, a man of DFI, a development financial institution, uh, how you see uh, the recovery. And you have been very successful in raising funds in the first quarter of this year. Uh, you have been oversubscribed in a major euro bond uh, issuing with environmental and social goals at record low cost for uh, an African uh, issuer. So you are in the center of what is happening in terms of the financing, and it was evoked by Bertrand Badré this morning, the first session, uh, with some elements of uh, uh, doubts about financing development. Do you share this view? Or are you a bit more uh, uh, optimistic? What do you see in terms of recovery of development? Well, <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Lionel. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. Um, for answer to your very question, I would like to, uh, to thank the uh, organization of the uh, WPC to have uh, made this conference possible in the context we all know, uh, and in such a, such a gorgeous place, I have to say. I would also like to thank in person Thierry de Montbrial, and I remember the days where, you know, I've invited him, I used to invite him for, uh, when I was running Global Market for a French institution, and I have invited him to, uh, to perform in, uh, in front of the CFOs of our group, and Thierry de Montbrial has been so exceptional. And I believe that <coughs> if I'm sitting here today in my new capacity of chairman, CEO, Chairman of the uh, West African Development Bank. It's maybe a little bit uh, because of him, because I've, I believe that I've been credited a little bit of his performance and of his success, as we say in French, on the prêt de So I believe that you know I've benefited a little bit of his of his uh, extraordinary capacity to perform. So thank you, Thierry Montréal. Thank you for this. Now, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. To, Coming back to your very questions, there are three key elements I would like to share here with you today. And um, I would like to stress out today, the first one is this debate, inflation versus deflation or stockflation. The second one is in the current context, post-pandemic, what is the, how is this question, how do we deal with this question of the pay down of public debt? Uh, and the third element, to come back to your very question, the last very point you have, um, you have highlighted, uh, the role of development bank, and um, uh, which might appear a little counterintuitive, I would say, the, the strong belief we have, and that would not come to you as a surprise, the, the, the real belief we have in the market, in global market, which is this, uh, this uh, confrontation between an offer and a demand. So the first thing is the risk of inflation or stockflation. Notably in the case of the occurrence of deglobalization or, or I would say partial deglobalization midterms. 
I would say that there are two pitfalls we would need to avoid, or we should try as much as possible to avoid. And the first one being, you know, the self-sustained deflation, the risk of, you know, the self-fulfilling predicts. Um, the anticipation of lower prices will lead to uh, a, a, a less dynamic demand, a slower demand, lower investment, and that would naturally, at the end of the day, lead to lower prices. Not to forget, not to forget that prices, that lower prices of assets leads to higher real interest rates, which is naturally something we definitely need to avoid, I would say, from uh, uh, um, sovereign and public, uh, sovereign public issues. The second thing is the sharp increase of prices at the opposite. That could lead to situations we currently face, I would say, in countries like South Africa, Lebanon, Argentina, Venezuela, and I even saw on TV yesterday, or the day before, uh, yesterday I think the intervention of the Prime Minister of France, who was, um, who was trying, to, um, trying to convince uh, the, the French population that you know, uh, there wouldn't be any search in the, in, the, uh, in the gas, in the gas process. So, because from a social standpoint, these are, uh, uh, these are things one should, as much as possible, try to avoid. If I had a magical stick, I would tell you that the good compromise here is naturally a little bit of inflation. The world can afford it. We currently stand at less than 3%. The world can afford a little bit of inflation. That would be, that would lead to less pain, uh, uh, less painful, or let me rephrase it, that would lead to painless uh, debt repayment. And we believe that the current tensions are, uh, we, we have um, on prices, uh, the current tensions we currently face are non-recurrent. We believe that they are transitional. Um, and it's, it marks the inadequation between supply and demand. The supply chain is, as we speak, the supply chain is destabilized, and we believe that the situation is temporary. The surge, the surge of economic growth we face is fueled by a strong demand, and the subsequent inflation is also led by this demand. The second element I would like to, to, to point out emphasize here today in front of you is how to, in this context, how to pay down public debt without slowing down economic growth and provoke a crisis of confidence. The, the debt write-off can be a very seductive debate, and we have had this debate recently can be very seductive. We don't believe that it is the ultimate situation, the ultimate solution. We believe that we should explore a little bit more the, the uh, and that's the trend actually, the, the, um, from the international community. First, there are a number of solutions starting by alleviating the debt service. The second solution, and we could elaborate on, 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 on all this, but the second one should be to provide concessional funding long-term with lower sensitivity to government budgets. These are solutions, and the funds are there, and we'll come back to this later on. The third one, as an illustration, and... Um, Mr. Prime Minister, you have mentioned it, you have rightly mentioned this question of the SDR. There's a natural definition of the SDR, which is, I would say, and I'm speaking in front of former governor of the Banque de France and president of the ECB, 
a lot of respect, but there's this, there's this definition, classical definition of the SDR the, as a monetary solution. But there is also, and this is what we've been pushing for, um, a financial definition of the SDR, which means how do we support, how do we support the, um, mostly the emerging countries, how do we support them post-pandemic? The real rule when it comes to solving this kind of issue is to consider that at any point in time, cash is king. Liquidity is king. And cash being king, we believe that what's been put in place recently, value 23rd of August by the IMF, it is a very good solution. It is a very good solution. And we believe that um, that would give means and uh, means to uh, emerging countries um, to face um, non-governmental, non-budget issues, non-budget uh, uh, funding, but immediately to inject within the system this liquidity as Dior has been converted. From public sovereign issues. There are a number of solutions. I've partially mentioned it. Inflation can help alleviate debt smoothly, partially. And again, the world can afford that. The world can afford a little bit of inflation. In a context of high economic growth. One other solution from the uh, public sovereign issues could be the setting up of budget consolidation policies in the context of the risk of pot or social, potential social tensions. Again, South Africa has, from that perspective, uh, um, can, can, from that perspective, be an illustration. One other solution is debt reprofiling to benefit from the current low, very low, interest rates environment. As we know that interest, interest, uh, interest rates uh, are negative today. It is a huge, unique opportunity. Last thing I would like to highlight here is debt restructuring. Debt restructuring so as to restore the sustainability of public debt and avoid uh, repayment default. One key element again here is at any point in time, and this is my regular speech to, uh, to different governments and the ministers of finance are regularly made, is to avoid repayment default. Let's discuss reprofiling. Let's discuss, let's discuss uh, uh, restructuring. At any point in time, we should avoid um, repayment default. Mr. Prime Minister, your very last question. Yes, yes, we, we believe indeed in the market on the basis that, and this was my first observation when I moved from pure private capital market sector to, um, to public, to, I mean, to deal with public issues now. Um, the development banks, and notably in Africa, are way, 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 read my lips, they are way, way, way undercapitalized undercapitalized. So that's why, and that's why you have mentioned, we are currently roadshowing in order to double our chair one capital, in order to raise debt in the market. And we strongly believe that there are huge opportunities in the market. The market has strong pockets, strong liquidity pocket, pocket for a number of reasons, uh, aging of population, over, uh, over, over savings in a, a number of uh, uh, places in the world, notably in Asia, Japan, etc., etc. Now, uh, in a region where the economic growth is still very vivid, and I do agree with Ma'am uh, Minister, um, in 2020, in our region, the economic growth was in spite of the pandemic, was positive, 
which was one of the rare, 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 few rare uh, 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 region in the world. Because of a number of reasons, uh, um, the median year, the median age, sorry, in the region is 20 years old, 20 years old, which is huge opportunity to sustain this growth and also a threat. If we don't have, and if the governments in general do not, don't know how to deal with this. And our job as development bank is precisely to capture this energy and to wrap it so as to offer it to investors in the market. Basically, there are five criteria we're working on. There are five criteria the market is expecting from us. The first one is yield. What is the return on assets? First thing. The second thing is the rating. BOAD is one of the best rated um, organization in the, in the uh, region or in Africa. With the, uh, uh, we are BAA1. Um, so investment grade, mid of investment grade, eligible to, uh, uh, um, to a number of investors. Governance. Investors are looking more than ever to understand what's the organization, what are the process, et cetera, et cetera. That's why we have launched, uh, as you have rightly mentioned, the sustainability bond that's been a very high success earlier this year. Everything was on the table. The traceability of the funds is something that we've been putting on the table. Impact. What is the impact of the, of the funding? What is the impact? Of the, of the means we are uh, currently uh, um, uh, um, getting into the uh, market. Traceability, I've mentioned it. And the very last thing, it's a little bit technical, it's everything related to format. A number of investors are willing to invest in, in an SPV. We have to provide the SPV. Others would be willing to either go through a loan or a bond, a structured deposit, a swap whatsoever. So this is about flexibility this capacity to adapt ourselves to the market, but the pockets, the investment pockets, are very deep. That will be all for me, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serge. It was very comprehensive and, in a sense, uh, very optimistic because you, you have a, 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 tool kit, <coughs> sorry, a, a toolkit for uh, managing the increase in debt which, which is quite, uh, quite impressive. Uh, you, you, you are a, 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 a bit, how to say that, uh, willing to see a bit of more inflation with, without fear, uh, so, sometimes to be dangerous to enter yeah. in that sort of uh, situation. Uh, we can afford, you said it's affordable. It's affordable, with a uh, magic stick. Yeah, and, and, for, and, and for maybe a, a, short, a short while, but <coughs> it was very important that you, you, you emphasized the fact that our value chains are totally disturbed for the, for the time being. And uh, the jury is a bit out to see if this inflation is there to last or is, is essentially a sort of accidental effect of supply chains uh, disturbed by the strength of the recession and the strength of the recovery uh, as, as a contrast. So thank you very much for all of those uh, uh, elements. Uh, now, Pierre, maybe uh, as a development economist, you could try and make a synthesis. Uh, where are we going to uh, from what we uh, have experienced uh, this uh, this year and the previous uh, year. What are the structural trends that you see? Again, you are at the head of a network of economists globally. So you have a global view. Uh, can you share with us? Thank you, uh, Lionel. And let me also start by uh, thanking uh, Thierry and uh, the uh, WPC team for both for having me here and also for organizing this miracle. It is also for me the first time I take part in an in-person meeting over the last uh, two years. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, 
uh, it's quite moving to some extent. You ask me, Lionel, to reflect on the structural implications of COVID-19, and, and I would like to, to make five points. First, I think the pandemic has exposed a growing social unease toward complexity and uncertainty. And what I mean by that is that from the reaction that we observe from our public, people want to know what will happen. So we are always in a sort of uh, illusion of determinism. And even more, they expect governments to solve that uncertainty for them. And if the government says something and then changes mind because information has changed uh, over a space of, let's say, of one week or two weeks, then there is a strong critique about the inability of the government to take decisions that would conform with the evolution. So one loses one big aspect of policy, which is precisely to manage shocks and uncertainty. This is not what the public expects. So this tension, I think, is at the core of some of the political difficulties that we observe during the crisis. I'm reminded of a book written by a Harvard psychologist called Daniel Gilbert. He wrote a book several years ago called Stumbling on Happiness, in which he related happiness to the lack of uncertainty about the future. And he said, what makes people unhappy is uncertainty about the future. Well, I think the pandemic has really powerfully demonstrated uh, uh, that. But at the same time, we all know that the pandemic is one of these unexpected, unknown shocks, but there will be more. So we need to uh, teach uh, our public that uncertainty is a part of life, and we need to learn how to think about risk and to manage risk. To some extent, we need more financial reasoning about all these, uh, all these uh, issues. The uh, second uh, point I would like to mention uh, is that uh, we have had very encouraging policy and technology reactions. And the reason why we are here is precisely because in the face of these terrible pandemics, there were solutions, policy solutions and technical solutions. So in a way, we could be satisfied with that, except that we, uh, and, and this is related to the first point, we forgot that solutions create new problems. Solutions don't create a perfect world. So we are now talking about inflation and public debt, at least public debt from the point of view of developed countries. I'll say a word about developing countries because it's, I think the, 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 the external dimension of the debt is, 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 is a bigger issue. But these are, I mean, I prefer debt to death. So we were right to do what we did. It was a wonderful policy decision in the face of pre-existing rules that would have, in principle, prevented us from doing so, especially in Europe. We took the right decision, so now we can lament about the problems it creates. It's a fact of life. We are constantly dealing with problems that we created. So let's deal with the current debt and inflation problem. So let's start with inflation. I, I fully agree with my neighbor about inflation. We just don't know whether it will be transitory or permanent. We can follow it, monitor it very deeply, and there are indicators to do that. The indicators that may be the more relevant ones are trimmed inflation. You take, you take out of inflation the extreme price movements. Why? Because we know that these extreme price movements are related to a surge of growth after a big decline during the pandemics and a supply barrier and supply constraints that may be transitory. If we look at trimmed inflation, we get a picture that is not that worrying. It requires monitoring and we can accommodate some more inflation. There is nothing in economics that tells you that 2% is better than 3%. What the economics will tell you is that if you go from 2 to 3 and then from 3 to 4 and then from 4 to 6, then you may have created a dynamics of inflation that is problematic. But the level of inflation itself 
is not per se the, the problem. So let's be realistic about that. We are managing the problem, central banks monitoring on a daily basis, and there is a number of people taking part in the debate that also contribute to that monitoring. Debt is a different subject because debt mixes moral arguments with economic arguments. And when people see debt increase, then they react from the moral argument and say, oh, that's bad. There are two things in debt that preoccupy me as an observer. One is this moral dominance of the judgment, and the second one is the ongoing inequity between debtors and creditors. Debtors are always wrong. They took debt. But when we say that, we forgot that for debt to exist, you also need creditors. So when there is excess debt, why should it be the fault of the debtor? It is also the fact that creditors lend too much. On the very specific issue of public debt, there is another very important dimension, which is that it is part of the savings investment balance. What would rich people do, and of inequality, by the way, what would rich people do if there was no public debt instrument to invest in? Well, they would invest right now in more speculative titles. And we know that it's a problem. So public debt is also one way to solve or to address this excess savings situation in which we are. And there are structural reasons for excess savings. One is the demography, but the other one is inequality. With inequality, you have a bigger distance between rich people and poor people, and rich people save more. So you have excess savings. And in a world where you don't have the investment, the private in productive investment opportunities, or people don't know them and they need to discover them, then that goes to speculative measures. So public debt is one way to restructure these excess savings from speculation to spending that can make sense socially. Therefore, the big issue about debt is not its level. It is the quality of public spending. And that leads me to the third point. The problem is that we don't know how to assess the quality of public spending. It's a judgmental behavior. And therefore, we try to replace that by quantitative rules. Well, the, and, and what COVID-19 has shown is that these quantitative rules don't work because they are not adapted to crisis situations. So in a way, we need to find something better to monitor debt than arbitrary criteria that again mean nothing from an economic point of view. They mean something from a management point of view. To avoid making mistakes, mistakes, let's control, let's put ceilings on the debt. Well, this is not adapted to a situation in which we have recurring shocks. So we need to find more, and that's one of the implications I draw, the fact that we need to think hard about the kind of rules that might be useful to help us manage these ongoing problems more successfully. The fourth implication is the necessary change in the value system. Lionel, you mentioned something which uh, struck me as, as very important. You say that in times of war and in times of crisis like this, we rediscover that what you call ordinary people play a big role in society. Yes, indeed, but this big role is not recognized by the economic, the market values. That's something that will have to change. And the, the other dimension of this crisis of values is, of course, environment, biodiversity, and climate. These are not well recognized by the market system. So, and in order for government policies to help, we need to have these ongoing, it has started to take place, change of values that will be a long-term thing, but it is also necessary uh, to, to see it uh, happen. The final uh, point I would like to make is about the power of globalization. Power in both the positive sense and the negative sense. In the negative sense, we saw it with the pandemic. It was really a globalized crisis, and there will be more. In the positive sense, there was a global response to it. I think we should not underestimate the virtue of scientific and technical cooperation across countries. That continued to happen. So we have an example of uh, what Masoud Ahmed described in the first session, 
this tension between very powerful forces of globalization, and indeed the digital economy is one of them, the global public good is another very powerful globalization necessity. These questions we cannot solve on our side. We need a global response to climate change, to biodiversity protection, to security issues, and to the movement of persons, which indeed is the uh, weaker frontier uh, in this open economic world that we wanted to, to, to create. My only point there is that I believe that the management of globalization has to be based on politics. And it was, it was based on a high political agreement that took place after World War II, that was based on shared global values and the Cold War. That has exploded now. And the main reason for the difficulties are partly the US-China uh, conflict and the problems created by China's emergence and the uh, prospect of changing China power grow up till 2049 and beyond. But it seems to me that one aspect of the crisis has a lot of bearings on the governance of globalization. It is a domestic dimension of the crisis and the lack of legitimacy of liberal democracies in our country. And that is something that uh, worries me uh, a lot because I think that this uh, need to uh, find ways or a path toward a higher political debate around shared values in the world to incur the future governance of globalization uh, requires uh, finding also shared values within countries. And this has become a political problem in all our societies. So there are some of the, of the structural trends, some of them produced by COVID, some of them revealed by COVID, some of them pre-existing the COVID situation, but I think that they will uh, characterize uh, certainly uh, many of the political debates to come in the, in the future. Uh, Brodel was quoted this morning as mentioning that capitalism needed a patron. I do think personally that economics needs politics and that without a political framework, markets do not function. And I believe in markets. So I, the opposition between markets and politics for me is wrong-headed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pierre. Really, <coughs> it was very uh, much a synthesis and with great clarity. I think that this panel has shown uh, how complex is the situation because uh, Aminata has uh, emphasized the fact that uh, we have uh, no solution for the informal sector uh, and it has been revealed by uh, the pandemics uh, and we have uh, social instability, inequalities, poverty growing. Yet, <laughs> the same Aminata said, we are now far better aware of our own strengths and what we have to do to be more independent, so it's very contrasted. Uh, Nicholas even g gave us some elements of, of optimism on the fact that a crisis is not equal to uh, the rise of populism and irrationality, non-rational policies, and that we see uh, other ways and, and better governance. And I think that many of, of you have uh, underlined the fact that we have made progress of governance, of cooperation. In, in a strong formula, I mean, as I said, multilateralism has died during uh, the, the pandemics. I think it's important that it's seen that way in Africa, in Africa, because it's not seen the same way in the rest of the world where yeah. you could have had a feeling of better cooperation. But even in, in Africa, what we have seen is a better African Union governance, collective governance, which means that our multilateralism at the level of a continent has hugely progressed. And you would not have had uh, the SDR uh, allocation uh, at a record level if you didn't have had the African Union driven by President Ramaphosa in a dialogue with the European Union 
and especially the, the president of France and the Chancellor of Germany, uh, in, in, in a Friday of April uh, 2020. So, in some cases, we had uh, some progress of governance. But I would say the governance in a continent like Africa, both domestically and collectively for the Union, has made huge progress. And the capacity of dialogue with the IMF or, or with the European Union, which is without any precedent. And I would like that uh, we, we remain on this note. And again, you've seen that in terms of the risk of inflation or the opportunity of a small inflation move uh, has been a bit unanimous as not being that much of a, of, of a threat. Yeah. And you have a panoply <coughs> of probably uh, uh, policy instruments uh, in order to, to monitor uh, the, 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 the new pattern of, uh, of, reco of recovery. So, I would like to remain on this uh, note, positive note, and thank you very much for having sure. given this, uh, delivered this message uh, today. Thank you all. Thank you.